Sketches by Boz, Section Thirty Nine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Sketches by Boz by Charles Dickens, Section Thirty Nine. Characters, Chapter Seven: The Misplaced Attachment of Mister John Dounce. If we had to make a classification of society, there is a particular kind of men whom we should immediately set down under the head of old boys, and a column of most extensive dimensions the old boys would require. To what precise causes the rapid advance of old boy population is to be traced, we are unable to determine. It would be an interesting and curious speculation, but as we have not sufficient space to devote to it here, we simply state the fact that the numbers of the old boys have been gradually augmenting within the last few years, and that they are at this moment alarmingly on the increase. Upon a general review of the subject, and without considering it minutely in detail, we should be disposed to subdivide the old boys into two distinct classes, the gay old boys and the steady old boys. The gay old boys are paunchy old men in the disguise of young ones, who frequent the quadrant and regent street in the daytime, the theatres, especially theatres under lady management, at night, and who assume all the foppishness and levity of boys without the excuse of youth or inexperience. The steady old boys are certain stout old gentlemen of clean appearance, who are always to be seen in the same taverns at the same hours, every evening, smoking and drinking in the same company. There was once a fine collection of old boys to be seen round the circular table at Offley's every night, between the hours of half-past eight and half-past eleven. We have lost sight of them for some time. There were, and may be still, for aught we know, two splendid specimens in full blossom at the Rainbow Tavern in Fleet Street, who always used to sit in the box nearest the fireplace, and smoked long cherry-stick pipes which went under the table, with the bowls resting on the floor. Grand old boys they were, fat, red-faced, white-headed old fellows, always there, one on one side the table and the other opposite, puffing and drinking away in great state. Everybody knew them, and it was supposed by some people that they were both immortal. Mr. John Dounce was an old boy of the latter class, we don't mean immortal, but steady, a retired glove and braces maker a widower resident with three daughters, all grown up and all unmarried, in Cursitor Street, Chancery Lane. He was a short, round, large-faced, tubbish sort of man, with a broad-brimmed hat and a square coat, and had that grave but confident kind of roll peculiar to old boys in general. Regular as clockwork, breakfast at nine, dress and titivate a little, down to the Sir Somebody's head, a glass of ale and the paper, come back again, and take daughters out for a walk, dinner at three, glass of grog and pipe, nap, tea, little walk, Sir Somebody's head again, capital house, delightful evenings. There were Mr. Harris, the law stationer, and Mr. Jennings, the robe-maker, two jolly young fellows like himself, and Jones, the barrister's clerk, rum fellow that Jones, capital company, full of anecdote, and there they sat every night till just ten minutes before twelve, drinking their brandy and water, and smoking their pipes, and telling stories, and enjoying themselves with a kind of solemn joviality particularly edifying. Sometimes Jones would propose a half-price visit to Drury Lane or Covent Garden to see two acts of a five-act play, and a new farce, perhaps, or a ballet, on which occasions the whole four of them went together, none of your hurrying and nonsense, but having their water and brandy first, comfortably, and ordering a steak and some oysters for their supper against they came back, and then walking coolly into the pit when the rush had gone in, as all sensible people do, and did when Mr. Dounce was a young man, except when the celebrated Master Betty was at the height of his popularity, and then, sir, then, Mr. Dounce perfectly well remembered getting a holiday from business, and going to the pit doors at eleven o'clock in the forenoon, and waiting there till six in the afternoon, with some sandwiches in a pocket-handkerchief, and some wine in a file, and fainting after all with the heat and fatigue before the play began 
in which situation he was lifted out of the pit into one of the dress-boxes sir by five of the finest women of that day sir who compassionated his situation and administered restoratives and sent a black servant six foot high in blue and silver livery next morning with their compliments and to know how he found himself sir by god between the acts mr downs and mr harris and mr jennings used to stand up and look round the house and jones knowing fellow that jones knew everybody pointed out the fashionable and celebrated lady so-and-so in the boxes at the mention of whose name mr downs after brushing up his hair and adjusting his neckerchief would inspect the aforesaid lady so-and-so through an immense glass and remark either that she was a fine woman very fine woman indeed or that there might be a little more of her eh jones just as the case might happen to be when the dancing began john dounce and the other boys were particularly anxious to see what was going forward on the stage and jones wicked dog that jones whispered little critical remarks into the ears of john dounce which john dounce retailed to mr harris and mr harris to mr jennings and then they all four laughed until the tears ran down out of their eyes when the curtain fell they walked back together two and two to the steaks and oysters and when they came to the second glass of brandy and water jones hoaxing scamp that jones used to recount how he had observed a lady in white feathers in one of the pit-boxes gazing intently on mr dounce all the evening and how he had caught mr dounce whenever he thought no one was looking at him bestowing ardent looks of intense devotion on the lady in return on which mr harris and mr jennings used to laugh very heartily and john dounce more heartily than either of them acknowledging however that the time had been when he might have done such things upon which mr jones used to poke him in the ribs and tell him he had been a sad dog in his time which john dounce with chuckles confessed and after mr harris and mr jennings had preferred their claims to the character of having been sad dogs too they separated harmoniously and trotted home the decrees of fate and the means by which they are brought about are mysterious and inscrutable john dounce had led this life for twenty years and upwards without wish for change or care for variety when his whole social system was suddenly upset and turned completely topsy-turvy not by an earthquake or by some other dreadful convulsion of nature as the reader would be inclined to suppose but by the simple agency of an oyster and thus it happened mr john dounce was returning one night from the sir somebody's head to his residence in cursitor street not tipsy but rather excited for it was mr jennings birthday and they had had a brace of partridges for supper and a brace of extra glasses afterwards and jones had been more than ordinarily amusing when his eyes rested on a newly opened oyster shop on a magnificent scale with natives laid one deep in circular marble basins in the windows together with little round barrels of oysters directed to lords and baronets and colonels and captains in every part of the habitable globe behind the natives were the barrels and behind the barrels was a young lady of about five-and-twenty all in blue and all alone splendid creature charming face and lovely figure it is difficult to say whether mr john dounce's red countenance illuminated as it was by the flickering gaslight in the window before which he paused excited the lady's risibility or whether a natural exuberance of animal spirits proved too much for that staidness of demeanour which the forms of society rather dictatorially prescribe but certain it is that the lady smiled then put her finger upon her lip with a striking recollection of what was due to herself and finally retired in oyster-like bashfulness to the very back of the counter the sad dog sort of feeling came strongly upon john dounce he lingered the lady in blue made no sign he coughed still she came not he entered the shop can you open me an oyster my dear said mr john dounce dare say i can sir replied the lady in blue with playfulness and mr john dounce eat one oyster and then looked at the young lady and then eat another and then squeezed the young lady's hand as she was opening the third and so forth until he had devoured a dozen of those at eightpence in less than no time can you open me half a dozen more my dear inquired mr john dounce 
"'I'll see what I can do for you, sir,' replied the young lady, in blue, even more bewitchingly than before. And Mr. John Downs ate half a dozen more of those at eightpence. "'You could have managed to get me a glass of brandy and water, my dear, I suppose,' said Mr. John Downs, when he had finished the oysters, in a tone which clearly implied his supposition that he could. "'I'll see, sir,' said the young lady, and away she ran out of the shop and down the street, her long auburn ringlets shaking in the wind in the most enchanting manner, and back she came again, tripping over the coal-cellar lids like a whipping-top, with a tumbler of brandy and water, which Mr. John Downs insisted on her taking a share of, as it was regular ladies' grog, hot, strong, sweet, and plenty of it. So the young lady sat down with Mr. John Downs in a little red box with a green curtain, and took a small sip of the brandy and water, and a small look at Mr. John Downs, and then turned her head away and went through various other serio-pantomimic fascinations, which forcibly reminded Mr. John Downs of the first time he courted his first wife, and which made him feel more affectionate than ever. In pursuance of which affection, and actuated by which feeling, Mr. John Downs sounded the young lady on her matrimonial engagements, when the young lady denied having formed any such engagements at all. She couldn't have bear the men, they were such deceivers. Thereupon Mr. John Downs inquired whether this sweeping condemnation was meant to include other than very young men, on which the young lady blushed deeply. At least she turned away her head, and said Mr. John Downs had made her blush. So, of course, she did blush, and Mr. John Downs was a long time drinking the brandy and water, and at last John Downs went home to bed, and dreamed of his first wife, and his second wife, and the young lady, and partridges and oysters, and brandy and water, and disinterested attachments. The next morning John Downs was rather feverish with the extra brandy and water of the previous night, and, partly in the hope of cooling himself with an oyster, and partly with the view of ascertaining whether he owed the young lady anything or not, went back to the oyster-shop. If the young lady had appeared beautiful by night, she was perfectly irresistible by day, and from this time forward a change came over the spirit of John Downs's dream. He brought shirt-pins, wore a ring on his third finger, read poetry, bribed a cheap miniature painter to perpetuate a faint resemblance to a youthful face, with a curtain over his head, six large books in the background, and an open country in the distance. This he called his portrait. Went on altogether in such an uproarious manner that the three Miss Dounces went off on small pensions, he having made the tenement of Cursitor Street too warm to contain them, and in short, comported and demeaned himself in every respect like an unmitigated old Saracen as he was. As to his ancient friends, the other old boys at the Sir Somebody's head, he dropped off from them by gradual degrees. For even when he did go there, Jones, vulgar fellow that Jones, persisted in asking when it was to be, and whether he was to have any gloves, together with other inquiries of an equally offensive nature, at which not only Harris laughed, but Jennings also. So he cut the two all together, and attached himself solely to the blue young lady at the smart oyster-shop. Now comes the moral of the story, for it has a moral after all. The last-mentioned young lady— having derived sufficient profit and emolument from John Downs's attachment, not only refused, when matters came to a crisis, to take him for better or worse, but expressly declared to use her own forcible words that she wouldn't have him at no price. And John Downs, having lost his old friends, alienated his relations, and rendered himself ridiculous to everybody, made offers successively to a schoolmistress, a landlady, a feminine tobacconist, and a housekeeper, and being directly rejected by each and every of them, was accepted by his cook, with whom he now lives, a hen-pecked husband, a melancholy monument of antiquated misery, and a living warning to all uxorious old boys. End of section 39